Hello, friends. The Eve Accordia, and welcome along to something very new and very special. It is May Day, a day of great significance historically, and you may have noticed that we are living through remarkable and uh, historic times. We hope that you're all keeping well and safe at home, and we hope that history, that old reliable, uh, is bringing you some joy. Today, we have two brief talks exploring different aspects of history, both linked to the moment. Uh, firstly, let me introduce us. My name is Donald Fallon. I'm a historian of 20th century Dublin and the presenter of the Three Castles Burning podcast. Our other speaker is Cathy Scuffle, historian in residence to Dublin City Council and local historian. Cathy's talk is very, very relevant to the world we currently live in. She will be telling us of the history of healthcare and hospitals on Dublin South Side and many of the institutions that Cathy will be talking to us uh, about today are at the forefront. They've morphed into institutions at the forefront of the battle uh, against COVID-19. My talk after Cathy is about this day, May the 1st, traditionally a day synonymous with the labour movement and exploring what May Day meant in revolutionary Ireland. And as we will learn, May Day has a long, and sometimes surprising history in Ireland. We'll be talking about May Day 1919 and the events of April and May 1920. That'll be later on. Now, allow us, before we start, to acknowledge all who made this possible. My thanks to Paddy Cahill for his technical skills and to Tara Doyle and all at Dublin City Public Libraries and the Festival of History, who do such great work in bringing history into the lives of Dubliners in ordinary times. These are extraordinary times. And while we must stay apart at present, history is a way in which we can come together. So here's the format. Cathy will go first. My talk will follow. Thank you for joining us. And now I hand you over to the very capable hands of Cathy Scuffle. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you for the celebration of May Day. And I suppose we'll just go straight into the slides now and we'll have a look at the story of hospitals and healthcare in the south side of Dublin. And it's very much the cradle of our hospital and healthcare system. And in recent weeks, we were very familiar with this scene. Uh, we've all witnessed the wonderful efforts uh, and the skills of our doctors and nurses, porters, cleaners the catering, the housekeeping, everybody involved in hospitals and healthcare's, And much of that has taken place in the Dublin Southside area. And this area has a very, very long tradition of hospitals and healthcare. In fact, the HSC headquarters are down at Houston Station. So we're, we're right in the middle of it all. And before we just move on from that, I think we should just mention the great efforts going on in James's Hospital, the Coombe and Cherry Orchard and in also our local pharmacies and even charities like the Little Flower Penny Dinners and, of course, the Liberty Soup Run. This tradition of care has a long uh, lifetime in our area. It goes right back and we'll see here from the Camino um, and even people like Alred the Palmer who founded his first hospital in Johns Lane um, and this was so important to the city at the time. Part of the Crusades, part of the actual actions and work of our hospitals. But to bring us more up to date we'll see that we had places like the South Dublin Union and the South Dublin Union was uh, established as, and here's the quote, a house of industry. But it was a little bit more than that. Founded in 1703 from an act of parliament, and it was really for the employment and maintaining of the poor thereof. On 14 acres in James Street in Dublin. And how they funded it was a tax on sedan chairs, hackney coaches and also a property tax, a tax on all the city houses. So this is where the funding for the South Dublin Union came from. By 1823, they changed that to direct parliamentary funding. So they, they had a system of grants that they issued for that. And by 1729, it also had a foundling hospital. And we can see that of maps in the area. You can see there the city workhouse facing onto James Street. And then in behind it, there was actually the area called Bedlam. And that's the forerunner of St. Patrick's Hospital in Steve. Stevens's Lane, and there's the Foundling Hospital in behind it. 
Now, the Foundling Hospital, it was a very austere looking building. It was built in 1704. So it's all part of the development of that part of the city. It was really a baby finding institution. That's the the best way of describing it. uh, 1,500 to 2,000 children were admitted on an annual basis. And these were illegitimate children or abandoned children in Dublin. And the idea of the Foundling Hospital was to avoid death and murder of these children and also to teach them the Protestant faith. By 1730, had a really awful item included in the doorway. It was a rotating cradle whereby the baby could be left in the cradle, ring the bell, and then the child was just brought in anonymously into the foundling hospital. Obviously, then there was no efforts being made to find the parents, and then there was no money changing hands. So the income for the foundling hospital came from a duty on coal that was applied across the city. They changed the way it was funded in and around 1822 and as the child's parish was being uh, charged for the child itself. So five pounds charge was put and this had an, an immediate effect on the numbers of children admitted to the foundling hospital. In fact, they dropped to about 500 per annum. The mortality rate was so high, four out of every five children admitted died and this resulted in regular inquiries by the administration. There was also a shortage of nurses. Uh, These were Protestant nurses. um, And that meant that they actually employed Roman Catholic nurses to take care of the children. This defeated the purpose, really, because then they ended up with a number of children who are now being reared in religious error. They were being reared as Catholics. Um, 1829, financial uh, assistance was discontinued for the Foundling Hospital. Uh, At this stage, it's costing nearly £10,000 per annum to actually fund it and there was no evidence that they were trying to preserve life or to even educate the children. So by 1835, thankfully, it was closed. Now, the Dr. Stevens's Hospital is another hospital that we had in the area and its motto actually reflects the tradition of the Camino and of pilgrimage in the area. It says, the good Samaritan healing the wounds of the fallen traveller, do thou likewise. It was a a very uh, imaginative building set around a courtyard, very similar to what was happening in the Royal Hospital in in Kilmainham. And by 1720, this Dr. Stevens's was one of Ireland's most distinguished medical establishments. It had been funded for by the will of Dr. Richard Stevens. That's where we get the name from. He had intended the proceeds of his estate to look after her, his sister in her, in her lifetime. But she brought the, um, the, the instructions of the will forward and she decreed that the hospital be actually set up. Her only stipulation was that she be allowed to live on the campus and she did that for the remainder of her life. Patients' uh, daily diet, this is an interesting one, included two quarts of beer and believe it or not Guinness's continued this tradition up until the closure of Dr Stevens's in 1987 and one-third but pint bottles of beer were made available on a daily basis for all the patients and for all the staff. Now, another hospital well known in the area was the Meath Hospital. And the Meath Hospital is famous for two Uh, important physicians who worked there. One man called William Stokes and another man, and you see his photo or his picture here, Robert Graves. And they say of Robert Graves, he fed fevers. He also, with William Stokes, managed to turn the Meath Hospital into one of the most important medical institutions in Europe. It had previously opened around 1753 on the Coombe in the Liberties to look after the people of the Liberties of Dublin. And then it moved to its larger premises in Haytesbury Street. That's actually Haytesbury Place or the Long Lane. Most people would know it as the Long Lane. The system of teaching physicians was that they were brought to the bedside of their patient and they were they were thought to observe 
the actual condition of the patient and the way they were responding, say, to treatment. And this was revolutionary. It was taking it out of the classroom and bringing it to the bedside. And during the typhus epidemic, this is where we get the quote that he fed fevers. Robert Graves developed a system whereby patients would be fed during their treatment. So he fed fevers as opposed to starving a cold. He's also attributed with uh, inventing the second hand on a watch or a clock. He never patented it, but he did it so he could take a patient's pulse. Now, if we look at what replaced the Mead Hospital on the Coombe in the Liberties, this it was the portico of it is still there. Um, and this was the old Coombe Maternity Hospital. When the general hospital moved, that site, Margaret Boyle in 1826 founded a maternity hospital for the people of the Liberties here. Um, it formally opened around 1829 and became known as the Coombe Lying In Hospital, but everybody knew it just as the Coombe. Um, and then it was actually taken over under a royal charter around 1867. The old Coombe moved to Dolphins Barn Street in uh, about uh, 20, uh, it, it moved to Dolphins Barn Street in 1967 and to actual modern purpose built premises there. But they retained the portico of the old hospital in memory of all the women who had given birth there over the years. And the portico itself is also a memorial to the characters of the Liberty. So it's well worth a, a little walk around the back of it. And you see the names of Bang Bang and Mary Wallpaper and all of those other well-known Liberties characters. Of course, the most important hospital that we had in the area was the Cork Street Fever Hospital, which was located exactly on Cork Street. And you can see from this image, it wasn't too far from the canal, which would have been one of the main uh, motorways, transport systems of the day. It was considered a, in a very good location because it had a fresh water supply. And this was very important because as it was a fever hospital, it was being used to treat fever patients. It, it had in, opened in 1804 and by 1812, 2,200 patients had been admitted and by 1814, they kept expanding it. So we now had 240 beds, fever beds available in the city. To give you an idea, some of the that it looked after. Scarlet fever um, around 1804, one in every 11 people would have died. By 1815, one in 20. So because of the hospital and the efforts of the hospital, mortality rates improved. The cholera epidemic of 1832, despite the best efforts of the staff of the Cork Street Fever Hospital, thousands of people died and this resulted in very hasty burials up in Bully Acre up near Kilmainham. During the 18, 1800s, there were six typhus epidemics in the city, and every time the hospital was extended a little bit further. In 1818, 3,000 cases were admitted to the hospital in one month. And in, uh, in 1826, they actually took care of 10,000 cases. It was so bad they erected tents in those four acres of ground around the hospital and this gave them an additional 400 beds. In 1847, at the height of the, um, the Irish famine, there was another typhus outbreak in Dublin. And they say that amongst the poor, many of them died in their own houses because vast numbers just remained there. Those who could not either be accommodated in the hospital or who never even thought of attending. In 1858, I found these records of burials in St. Luke's and these show that quite a number of fever burials were located to St. Luke's. Believe it or not, the recent archaeology on the site in St. Luke's discovered a sealed chamber with a number of uh, skeletal bodies and um, remains 
in these chambers. And we seem to think that this might be the burials that came from St. Luke's at that time. Now, we've another hospital or former hospital in the area, and that was the Adelaide Hospital. Now, the Adelaide Hospital had been founded in and around 1839 in Bride Street originally, but um, in 1859 it moved to where we would have all remembered it, as you can see it here, in Peter Street, um, not too far from Jacobs. It's attributed with many medical firsts. It treated all of the fevers that I had mentioned for the Cork Street Hospital, but it also treated smallpox epidemics, typhus, pneumonia and TB. Among its medical firsts were the first ICU unit in the Republic of Ireland. And we think of how many of them we need today because of the pandemic ongoing. Imagine the very first one was in our area. It also had a skin clinic. And another thing that it did was it was the first general hospital to have a gynecological department, meaning it could treat general medical issues in pregnant women. And this was one of the first to actually do that. And um, it also had a TB ward. Now, I'm going to put up something else here. This is uh, the logo for St. James's Hospital. I just want to leave it there for a moment because St. James's is, of course, our largest healthcare setting. It is actually the largest healthcare setting in Ireland. So this is now on the site of the former South Dublin Union and the Foundling Hospital in James Street in Dublin. In the middle of the last century, it was vastly expanded. It moved from being a care centre for older people to being a general hospital. And it took on board the services of Dr. Stevens when it closed, St. Patrick's, which is the mental hospital in Stevens's Lane and others. They were all brought together into the St. James's campus, bringing with them all of their expertise. Um, and of course, at the moment, we have the Nat National Children's Hospital actually being built on site, bringing things full circle from the foundling hospital that we had in the early 1700s. And now we'll have a children's hospital on the site, too. And the Coombe Hospital will ultimately relocate to St. James's also. Nearby, we have the HSC headquarters, as I mentioned at the beginning. They're on the site of the former Dr. Stevenson's. They actually occupied the building of Dr. Stevenson's hospital. And in 1997 and 1998, the Adelaide and the Meath hospitals created Tala the new general hospital in Tala. The Cork Street Fever Hospital moved to Cherry Orchard. So all of the hospitals we had in our area have moved on to other parts of our city. So basically we were the cradle of the health services. Um, nursing home and community care then went on to the site of the Cork Street Fever Hospital, creating Brew Quivine Nursing Home. That has recently been closed and we now have Belle Villa on the South Circular Road and the HSC services are on the Cork Street site. But just to bring you back to the logo of St. James's for a moment, if you look at it very closely, you see in the centre there's a scallop shell. And the scallop shell is the symbol of St. James and the Camino. It's the mark of a pilgrim. So even in the logo of the hospital, we can go right back to our early starts, the time of the Camino, of the Camino running through James Street. And I'm delighted to say that Dublin City Council honoured the Camino when Corina Nidalic, Councillor Nidalic, was Lord Mayor of Dublin. And we see her here holding the Camino book, the register of all our pilgrims over the years. So you can see very much that the south side, this particular part of the south side of Dublin, is indeed the cradle of hospital and healthcare in our city. Thank you all very much. Great. My thanks to Cathy for that brilliant talk. So many of those uh, institutions today at the forefront of this battle have an incredible history behind them. And I definitely learned a lot from that talk myself, not least when it comes to the watches that we all wear uh, on our wrists. So I've always been interested in the history of, of health in Dublin uh, in the revolutionary period, for example, the, the impact that the, 
the Spanish flu had on the populace here. But as we learned there, there's been many pandemics, epidemics and other things for us to contend with uh, going back centuries, even, even before that. So social history at its very best. My talk is on the subject of May Day in revolutionary Ireland. And May Day is many different things. I suppose it's marked in, in different ways by, by religious groups. Uh, it's a social occasion. But for the purpose of this brief talk, we're focusing on May Day as an international day uh, of the organized labor movement. The story of May Day, as we understand it, has its beginnings on the other side of the world in Chicago. And we'll see now one of the monuments in Chicago here we are, marking May 1886, when a labor demonstration at Haymarket Square in Chicago was at the center of very real violence. Workers were striking in pursuit of the eight hour working day. As police dispersed the meeting, there was chaos. Four civilians were killed, dozens wounded, and a number of police officers lost their lives in the chaos when a dynamite bomb was thrown uh, in their direction. And I suppose the madness that played out uh, on the streets of Chicago, in the words of the great Labour Studies historian William Adelman, he says that no single event has influenced the history of labour in Illinois, the United States and even the world more than the Chicago Haymarket Affair. It began with a rally on May 4th, 1886, but the consequences are still being felt today. And in the aftermath of that violence in Chicago, several men were hanged. Their involvement in the violence was disputed, but they became known as the, Haymar the Haymarket Martyrs. They sang La Marseillaise, the anthem of revolutionary France, and strongly associated with the labor movement as they went to the hangman's noose. And if you ever visit Chicago at the Haymarket Memorial, you might notice as a familiar looking figure, Jim Larkin. We'll just see a slide now. There are plaques from the international uh, labor movement in honor of the uh, Haymarket Martyrs, including this one uh, from SIP2 and that great famous image of Jim Larkin. Uh, taken on the time of his arrival to Dublin in 1923, and the words that Larkin loved uh, so much, borrowed from the French Revolution, the great are not great, the great only appear great, because we are on our knees, let us rise. So commemoration of that violent event uh, in Chicago, that Labour rally uh, and anger around those events is the origins of May Day as we understand it. In the United States, there was a much more vibrant trade union movement uh, that you had here in Ireland in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Here's a great picture of James Connolly. One of the few pictures we have of Connolly actually as a, a union organizer speaking in the United States uh, of America. He was a member of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. They were known as the Wobblies for whatever reason God only knows, but this is Connolly speaking on a, a platform in New York City uh, as a trade union organizer with the IWW. So May Day was a very, very important day in the United States. Uh, for, for the labour movement. It was a day on which uh, to come out. Dublin's early May Day rallies happened in the Phoenix Park in the late 19th century. The first one we can find happened in 1890. A man by the name of Adolphus Shields was centrally involved in, uh, in, in organising them. Fantastic character, Adolphus Shields. He was the father uh, of Barry Fitzgerald, who went on to win an Oscar, known as William Shields, and the father of Arthur Shields, a uh, brilliant, brilliantly talented actor in the Abbey Theatre who would fight in the 1916 Rising. Their dad, Adolphus, was really an early pioneer of trade unionism and socialism uh, in Dublin and behind some of the earliest May Day rallies. The numbers are quite significant, around 10,000 people in the Phoenix Park uh, in 1890. Shields himself used uh, one speech to attack Home Rule MPs who failed to support the eight-hour bill in Westminster, the eight-hour working day. And some really interesting speakers uh, spoke at these rallies in the Phoenix Park, including Eleanor Marx, uh, the daughter of Karl Marx. We have an image of her. There she is. Uh, she told the crowd of thousands in the Phoenix Park in 1891 that unions were helping to do away with the hatred and prejudices which it had been the object of capitalists to foster. So you had kind of this international Labour Day, if you will. It begins in Chicago, but by the late 19th century, uh, it's happening here in Dublin uh, as well. And people like Eleanor Marx are, are, are speaking at it. Uh, the story of Irish trade unionism, I suppose, changed very significantly in the early 20th century. There was a, a new kind of trade unionism born in Ireland. In the 19th century, the 1890s and the like, you would have had kind of craft unions uh, in Dublin. So, you know, if you were a printer, you're in the printer's union. And if you were a tram driver, you're in the tram driver's union. But by the early 20th century, 1909 in particular, all of that was changing. 
with the birth of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. That was the union of Larkin uh, and Connolly. And the name is significant, Irish Transport and General Workers Union. Who's a general worker? A general worker is basically everyone. So the ITGWU was a union that was open essentially to all workers, regardless if they were skilled or unskilled, young or old, uh, male or female. And it grew into a very, very significant fighting force. They were bloodied uh, in 1913, the year of the lockout. But by the time of the Irish War of Independence, uh, the union was in a very, very strong position. Now, the Irish Revolution, which begins in January 1919 uh, with the, the Salahed Beg ambush, the War of Independence, I think there's a real tendency to view the Irish Revolution in a very narrow way. You know, we see it as the IRA in one corner and, and the British Army in the other. But in truth, there's a lot more going on than that. There's an entire political revolution happening in Ireland a century ago. You have Dáil Éireann, a revolutionary parliament which had its own courts, it had its own parliament, it had its own police. You have the trade unions, which are getting increasingly stronger and stronger. And one reason the unions, I think, are doing very well 100 years ago, wartime inflation, just after the First World War, you know, it had driven up the price of everything. Militancy was on the rise. And I think people were also looking at the continent of Europe and, and beyond of what was happening in, in the labour movements very, very broadly. So there was a real belief, I think, in, in Ireland in 1919 and 1920 that the labour movement was in a strong place, not just in Ireland, but internationally. 1919, a number of things happened, I think, which would have made the authorities in London sit up and pay attention to Ireland. Uh, there was, of course, the, the, the so-called Limerick Soviet in April 1919, uh, basically a, a strike in the centre of Limerick. Uh, a strike committee shut down the city, uh, and it becomes known in the press at the time as the Limerick Soviet. They never call it the Soviet themselves, but the term catches on in the press and in that same year, in January 1919, a very significant strike in, in Belfast, uh, where thousands of workers, most of them actually Protestant and Unionist, uh, came out on strike, demanding improved conditions uh, as well. So there was, a, there was a lot of militancy in the country, uh, in the workers' movements by, by 1919. Things were happening in England too, and in Scotland. May Day 1919 estimated that 100,000 people, 100,000 people, took to the streets of Glasgow, uh, where they were addressed by various speakers, including Constance Markovich, who was now an elected MP for Sinn Féin. They sang the Red Flag, which is the kind of international uh, labour movement anthem. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they sang the soldier song, uh, Our on the Vian, uh, with gusto. So there was something happening in these islands, very broadly speaking, uh, by around May Day 1919. We have the poster for that May Day. There it is, produced by the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, and a lot of words on it, you know, it kind of breaks every rule of graphic design when it comes to a good poster, which should be shortened to the point, but it calls <laughs> on the workers of Dublin to come out uh, onto the streets. It's, you know, calls on workers to show, quote, that Irish workers join with the international labour movement in demanding a democratic league of free nations. What kind of strength did the union have? Well, there's about 15,000 people in the ITGWU in 1940, right after the defeat of the lockout, by 1919, there's about 102,000 people uh, in the union. That's an incredible level of growth. Uh, one historian describes it as, as Lazarus-like, and it definitely was. The membership came out across the entire country. Uh, May Day in 1919 was a very unusual thing. It seems to vary massively community by community, wherever you live. In parts of the country, local units of the IRA seem to march beside the union. So I suppose that says a lot about local relationships more than official Po uh, statements of policy. In Dublin, everything just came to a halt. And it sounds a little bit like Dublin at the moment during COVID-19. The Irish Independent said the day was idle, dull and dismal. In Dublin, there were no trams, no North Wall sailings, no theatres, no cinemas, no electric power, no taxis, no restaurants, no pubs open, no trains, uh, except the Great Northern Railway. So we're living with a bit of that ourselves uh, at the moment as well. Regionally, May Day 1919 really surprises me when you get out of the big national papers and you get into the local papers, what you see happening around the country. In Killarney, there are a thousand people marching through the streets of Dublin behind red flags. And the Father Matthew Band were involved in that one. So you have this unusual relationship between the labour movement and even the temperance movement. You know, it seemed like everyone was getting on the bandwagon. Uh, in Clonmel, it was reported that several hundred people marched behind uh, red flags. and right across the island of Ireland, what comes through in the reports 
is that they sang the same song everywhere. Well, they sang the same two songs everywhere. Our on the Vein, which was kind of becoming the unofficial national anthem, still sung as the soldier's song, and the Red Flag, uh, which was written by an Irishman, Jim Connell, very famous international anthem uh, of the labour movement. So these two songs are being sung with gusto right across the island of Ireland on May Day 1919. 1920 was a different beast entirely. Uh, I suppose by 1920, the War of Independence had very much intensified. Not all that many people die in political violence in Ireland in 1919. Surprisingly few people do. It's actually a lot more dangerous for your health if you're a British soldier in 1919 in Ireland that you might catch the Spanish flu. It kills multiple times more British soldiers than the IRA succeed in doing. But by 1920, things are different. I mean, by 1920, the war in Ireland is really on. In the opening months of 1920, there's kind of coordinated attacks on RIC, Royal Irish Constabulary, barracks across the island. Uh, there's the burning of income tax offices all over Ireland. That's always very popular. Uh, the shooting dead of intelligence police on the streets of Dublin. And eventually you end up with the arrival of the, the so-called black and tans to supplement uh, the RIC. So 1920 is a very, very different country from Ireland in 1919. And under the Defence of the Realm Act, which was very draconian legislation, uh, Mount Joy Prison in Dublin, Hotel Mount Joy, was beginning to fill up uh, in 1920. You're ending up, ending up with young men in prison without charge uh, in an increasingly crowded uh, prison. And by April 1920, the decision had been made inside Mount Joy to go on hunger strike. So the greatest moment of Irish labour in the entire revolutionary period, and arguably the greatest moment of Irish labour in its history, comes in 1920, just on the eve of May Day, late April. One of those who was in Mount Joy as a prisoner was Frank Gallagher. And in his really brilliant memoir, The Four Glorious Years, he talks about how the hunger strike of a few hundred men in Mount Joy became a city, a nation in revolt. It started very organically. Uh, workers kind of began downing tools in late April and making their way to the prison. A thousand workers at Broadstone Railway Station just walked away. They left the outbound train standing in the station. In Chicor, the workers at the railway shops did the same thing. They just put down everything and marched off to Mount Joy. And eventually, these kind of processions became enormous marches of workers. And I think what's incredible about it is they did it off their own volition. You know, the union didn't say to them, put down tools and go to Mount Joy. You know, people decided of their own volition that they were going to take some kind of action. The labor movement, if the workers lead, the movement has to follow. The Labour Party, the Trade Union Congress and the like, they decided that, well, if they're leading the way, we have to do the same thing. And the decision was made to call a general strike uh, in April, late April 1920. Quite incredible. I mean, they made the decision at the weekend and the strike was, I think, three days later. But they, they managed to bring the numbers out onto the street. And the manifesto said to the workers of Ireland, you're called upon to act swiftly and suddenly to save 100 dauntless men. At this hour, their lives are hanging by a tread in a Bastille. These men, for the greater part, our fellow workers and comrades in our unions have been forcibly taken from their homes and their families and imprisoned without charge. As trade unionists, we have only one weapon left, general strike, a weapon that may be used but seldom and only in times of supreme crisis. That strike on the 20th of April 1920 remains the most perfectly observed general strike in Irish history. And with the exception of Belfast, which was always Ireland's industrial capital, I mean, it was Belfast that built the Titanic. It was Belfast with the linen industry, Linenopolis. But with the exception of Belfast, the entire island of Ireland just came to a total standstill uh, on the 20th of April, uh, 1920. And the Irish Independent newspaper, the reports are just incredible. 1,500 tramway men among the strikers uh, in Dublin. The, time, the Independent said that even businesses owned by unionists are closing owing to their employees joining in. Uh, the strike. If you name it from the, the, the Shelburne Hotel to the Hibernian, all of Dublin ground to a total halt. And I love the report from Waterford uh, that appeared in, in one of the papers. They said, not a single man turned up to work. <laughs> we, presume, we presume that the police did, but most didn't. There's a beautiful image from 1920. We can see it there. Well, this is the staff of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. Uh, at Liberty Hall in 1919. Some very important people in there, Nora Connolly, daughter of James Connolly, uh, William O'Brien, uh, standing there to the, to the right uh, of the picture. But if you go forward one more, one more image will bring us to 1920. 
there we go. What a powerful image that is uh, taken outside Mount Joy Prison. I think this image uh, mm -hmm. made it as far as the made it as far as the New York Times. So that gives some impression uh, just how much attention was was on the island of Ireland at that time. Uh, the demand of the strike was for the release of the Mount Joy prisoners, uh, and it wasn't granted on the first day. So on the following day, the industrial action continued, and the general strike of the 20th of April became a two-day general strike. I think one thing that's interesting is that this was a time before Twitter or before WhatsApp or, or whatever else. You know, So getting word out into more remote parts of rural Ireland that there was a general strike in just a few days was a difficult thing to do. And what you see is that by the second day of the strike, it's reached even the most remote parts uh, of Ireland, which weren't uh, at first involved. The accounts are brilliant. I mean, the Freeman's Journal talks about Waterford and says the whole city was taken over by a Soviet commissioner who was in the employment of the railway and three associates. The Sinn Féin mayor abdicated and the Soviet took possession of the town hall for two days until the telegram arrived mm -hmm. reporting the release of the hunger strikers from Mount Joy. The city was in the hands of these men. So, you know, we hear so much about the Limerick Soviet. We never really hear about this happening in, in, in Waterford in 1920. The striking workers won the day and incredibly the prisoners were released. So I think that sent a message to the rank and file of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union that if you had a demand, if you went on strike and if you sought something, you could actually win. And it very much showed the power uh, of the labour movement. I think it's the day when Irish nationalism, if you will, and Irish trade unionism works hand in glove uh, together. May Day 1920 came literally just a few, a few days, a few very short weeks, a fortnight even, after uh, this general strike in April 1920. So it was a very kind of subdued affair. Uh, if you brought people out and strike on a two-day general strike, you can't exactly do it again two weeks later. Uh, but in Dublin, they did march through the streets. The Irish Transport and General Workers' Union marched to Glasnevin Cemetery, very significant numbers, uh, and they went to the graves of citizen army people who died in 1916, like Sean Connolly, the actor from the Abbey Theatre, uh, who'd been killed at, at City Hall. So you would have got the impression in May Day 1920 that the unions would still have a lot of strength. And in towns and villages across the island of Ireland, there were very impromptu marches. People just came out of their own volition uh, and marched through rural Irish towns behind red flags. In London, there was a very significant May Day in 1920, and the newspapers report on an Irish contingent marching in Hyde Park. Arrangements were made for about 72 speeches, including deliveries in English, Irish, Esperanto, Yiddish, Russian, Polish, and French. So never go to a trade union rally in London because you have to listen to 72 speeches. But this time really demonstrated the, the incredible crossover you know, between the unions and, and, and republicanism. And within weeks of May Day 1920, the munitions strike had begun, where this is really captured beautifully by Ken Loach in, in his film The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Liam Cunningham plays a, a train driver who refuses to allow British soldiers and British munitions uh, on board. Dublin dock workers basically refuse to handle any goods that are going to be used by the army. Then it spreads into the railway men, uh, and eventually the, 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 the apparatus of the British military in Ireland is just shut down. I don't think it's any coincidence that that strike happened so soon after May Day. I think there was a real sense of confidence in the Irish labour movement at that time. Uh, so it's been debated now for the guts of a century how involved was the union movement in the Irish Revolution. Kevin O'Higgins, later the Minister for Justice, he famously said that the Irish are the most conservative people who ever had a successful revolution. And when Eamon de Valera was asked about the relationship between the, the Red uh, and agree. And he, he was adamant. He said, we, we never made any promises to Labour because while the enemy was within the gate, the immediate question was to get possession of the country. In other words, Labour must wait and nationalism was to be the, the question of questions. But I think when we look at things like May Day 1919, May Day 1920, the 1920 general strike, it becomes very obvious to us that you know, the Labour movement was front and centre uh, to the Irish Revolution and that May Day was a hugely unpopular. If, if Easter Sunday or Easter Monday was the day that Irish nationalism would march and remember it's dead, May Day was the day that the Irish labour movement would march and show its strength. Those two talks were admittedly very different uh, in subject matter, but we hope that they both had appeal to you. Cathy's talk to me is a reminder, I suppose, that history is still being written. And I think that the heroic efforts of frontline workers in Dublin's medical institutions today 
will be subject for historians in the future. Uh, this was a brand new endeavour for everyone involved. It's certainly something that can be done again. And now that we have you on your computers at home, can I point you in the direction of a few things? The Dublin City Digital Depository, that's an amazing collection of scanned images, maps, and more besides from Dublin City Council's collections, all free to browse, easy to access uh, online, and you'll get lost in them. The podcasts from the Festival of History and from Dublin City Libraries are available on all platforms. You can learn about everything from the history of lemons, sweets, to street names from the War of Independence to the First World War. Uh, and do make sure you connect with Dublin City Public Libraries and the Festival of History uh, on all social media platforms. These are very odd times uh, for historians. I think I speak for all historians, the entire community, when I say I, I generally prefer my pandemics at the comfortable distance of a century ago. But we live in the times in which we find ourselves. And look, history will always be here. Until next time, thank you for tuning in. Slán August Bannacht.